Well, as you can see, we have skipped well, the end of section six about other estimation methods. We also have skipped the entire section seven about convergence and consistency. This is not because it's not interesting, but only we have a course of 15 hours, so it's difficult to fit it in into this framework. So we'll start with section eight about design options and model validation. So here also uh, there are quite a few slides that are there for your information. Well, the user must take a certain number of decisions when he is going to use system identification to model the system. So when you're using this data driven methodology using black boxes well we've seen in the beginning of the course that you have to think about experiment design then you have to choose a model structure select a criterion and an underlying well, algorithm for optimization for estimation and then very important you have to select a validation procedure and each of these decisions contains options and design variables and this is what we are going to explore in the next few slides well a few additional words about the choices that you can make for experiment design well of course you have to choose the inputs outputs that are going to be measured and we've seen previously how you should choose your inputs in order to make sure that the data is informative then you have the choice of the sampling period and this choice involves re really knowing a little bit about the system. Remember from the course of digital control that if you know the rise time, well, you should probably take 10 to 15 samples in this rise time of the system. Well, people have a tendency of choosing TS much more than necessary and this sometimes leads to what is called over sampling and this will be covered later in the course one of the design choices that you have is to either collect your data in open loop and in or in closed loop this is not explored in this 15 hour course but this can have influence on the methodology that you should choose so this is really beyond the scope of this course of course you have to choose the number of data points and then of course you have to pre-treat the data you're going to sample so one of these pre-treatments is of course making sure by low pass filtering that you do not have any aliasing effects well there is a subsection about sampling and preventing aliasing but i'm going to skip it because i think that you know everything that there is to know about sampling and preventing aliasing from the course of signals and systems another design option that you have is the choice of the model structure and more in particular the choice of the parameterization so are you going to use an ARX system model an output error model and so on and of course these type of model structures have well characteristics for instance in the framework of this 15 hour course what we can say for instance is that the ARX model is really good in prediction right and that the output error model is good in simulation so if you're good in simulation you're probably going to use an output error model or a box jenkins model and if you're interested in prediction you'll use an arx or rmax model of course once you have chosen your parameterization then you have to look at the model orders and choose the delay so for instance if it's an ARX model that you've chosen you have to choose NA and NB and you have to choose here the delay NK we'll talk about the choice of this delay later in the course well and the model orders is very important because we've seen in the beginning of the course that there is this phenomenon of 
overfitting. So choosing N A and N B too large will give a rise to problems. But if you use this procedure of de splitting your data set in two, one for estimation and one for validation, and you look at the validation costs for the choice of the model orders, well, really nothing can go wrong. And this will be further explored in this course as well. Well, you can also choose the identification or estimation method, but in this 15 hour course, we'll stick to prediction error methods and really will stick also to the function squared. So we'll minimize the sum of squares of the residuals. This is something that you can explore, but as we've told before, filtering or working with a filter only makes sense if you're using for instance a output error model because there you have a fixed noise model that is one and well choosing l will actually allow you to identify an output error model with a fixed noise model here also in the framework of this course we'll work with a prediction horizon of one when we do identification and well the numerical algorithm to compute theta hat well it's either the least squares and for the arx and the nonlinear least squares uh, so optimization methods for all the other model structures and this will be explored uh, also in the system identification lab so as far as the choice of the identification method is uh, concerned well the only freedom that you have is to play with l over here then we talk about model validation this third point will leave it aside it's there for your information so what we'll do is take validation data and compute the simulation and prediction costs so here in prediction we could use different horizons and this will be explored in the uh, associated laboratory so what you can do is well obtain the simulation and prediction one step ahead k step ahead on validation data look at uh, the graphs look at the costs but very important we'll also look at residual analysis remember this will be explored further is that you can look at well r epsilon epsilon and r epsilon u okay so you correlate the epsilons and normally if everything goes well ep epsilon should be well very close to a white noise sequence so there are statistical tests to see if this is indeed the case and if epsilon explains the data well well there should be little correlation between epsilon and u and this is what this is investigating before we talk about bias and variance considerations let us review the concept of bias and variance so we assume here that we have an estimate theta hat of some variable data well then the bias is the expected value of theta hat so a kind of the average value minus the actual value of theta right so it's kind of the error that you make on average the variance is really the expected value of the average estimation so it's the expected value of theta hat minus theta hat squared okay so it's the variation that you have around your average estimate so let us have a look as you can see here you have four bullseye charts and we assume that the actual theta is in the center right 
and we will look at bias and variance okay so let us have a look at what you see here on the right well you can see on average that your estimate it lies somewhere over here and well somewhere over here right whereas your actual value I'll put it in blue is over here right so there's quite a distance so indeed the bias is high whereas here you can clearly see that well the bias will be very well, small because you see that well the average value corresponds to the actual value so we have low bias if we have a look and we look at things in terms of variance you can see here that on top the variance is low because the variation around the estimate in red is small right whereas over here you have high variance you have lots of variation around the average estimate which is in red this is also the case over here so we'll translate this idea of bias and variance to our system identification framework. So we assume here that we are given a real system that is generating the data, which is G0, H0, and we stack all this information and we call it simply T0. So T0 stands for the actual system, right? But we are going to use a model structure gq theta hq theta and again we can stack it in and call it tq theta right so if we are given a data set of n with n data points we know that we are going to have an estimate theta hat n and I'll write the n here to stress that it's only based on a finite amount of data. So if you plug that in, you have here this t hat n based on the estimate theta hat n based on a finite amount of data. So assume now that we have an infinite amount of data impossible in reality of course but think of a really large data set so what we'll have is that theta hat n will converge to some theta star right this is the theta that you would identify based on an infinite amount of data if you plug it in over here you have here a t star so we are really interested in the difference, right? Tn hat minus T0. So this is really the difference between the identified model based on n data minus, well, the actual system, right? But what you can do here is subtract T star and add T star. And then you obtain two terms over here this one is the bias error this is the error that you have between the actual system and the one that you would have if you have had had an infinite amount of data right and here the variance error is the error that you see between your estimate based on n data and the one that you would have if you had had an infinite infinite amount of data so variance error well you can see this bias error as the error that you would make if you would have an infinite amount of data you identify a model using this infinite amount of data and you compare it with the actual system and you will see that this well bias error is really a affected by the model set and the model order okay so assume that the system is an actual system is an arx okay three three 
one this is an a and b and k and you only use for your model an arx two two one then there will be of course a bias error because your model this is the model right and this is the actual system the model no, is not capable of representing the actual system. You would also have bias if you choose an output error model, even if you take it 331, because it's not capable of representing the actual system. So bias is affected by the model structure, the model order. Okay, It's unaffected by the number of data right and you can also affect it by the frequency shapes where you put the energy in frequency the presence or not of a controller and a frequency filter but in our 15 hour course i'm happy if you know that the bias error is affected by the model structure and the model order and that it is unaffected by the number of data so the variance decreases with the number of data points. So let us compare a situation where we have a thousand and then we have data points and here 10,000. Let's make it a hundred thousand. It's easier. And we have our average estimate is the same on both sides. Well, the confidence interval here if it is like this well if you use a hundred times more data then we'll have a confidence interval well this distance here will be divided by the square root of 100 okay so it divided by 10 so the confidence interval will become a lot smaller so the variance is decreasing with n increasing of course, what is important also is the signal to noise ratio, right? If the signal to noise ratio increases, this means that you have the VU that is increasing, right? And the influence of the noise will be decreased, so the variance will decrease. The variance error will be increasing with the model error. Here we assume, of course, that n is fixed. But if n is fixed and you take more and more parameters in your model structure, well, the amount of information stays the same, but you have to identify more parameters. So the variance will increase. Well, again, we have skipped two subsections, one on informative experiments and the other one on sampling if you're interested you can have a look at the slides and of course there is also the reference book we will now look at the pre-treatment of data so this means things that you can do on the data before starting the actual identification well the first thing that you have to check is ts because choosing ts too small can lead to oversampling and there is a whole subsection devoted to that in the next section one of the signs of oversampling is that for instance you look at the system dynamics okay so g and you look at the bandwidth and if you see high frequency disturbances in the noise model above this bandwidth well typically this is a ts that has been chosen too small and this will lead to oversample. So what you have to do is to resample the data. Since you resample the data, you change the Nyquist frequency. So in order to obey the sampling theorem, what you should do is first apply a digital low pass anti-aliasing filter and then you can pick every est sample. Okay? So the combined operation anti-aliasing filter plus picking every est sample is called decimation and there is a MATLAB command for that called decimate. When you obtain data from a system there is a good chance that there are 
well outliers or that there is missing data so what you'll have to do is replace this between quotes bad data by interpolated data and there is a markup command for that miss data well this is something that you will not be exposed to in the system identification lab because you will get data that has already been cleaned but in reality this is really a uh, problem from practice there will also be low frequency disturbances such as drifts and offsets and there is a matlab command to remove the drifts uh, linear drifts or offsets and what it will do is that it will replace u of t and y of t the inputs and outputs by their deviations around a physical equilibrium or a working point so this has a linearizing effect remember that d trend will should be used if you're interested in simulation models if you're interested in prediction the effect of a d trend is rather small so it can be this operation can then be discarded if you have low frequency disturbances another idea is to well filter the data and we have seen that filtering the data is really working with a modified noise model we will now devote a few slides on model structure selection and the idea of course is that we want to obtain a good model so this is really talking about the quality of the model and at a low price so we have to define what we mean by price of the model so by quality of the model we mean that there is a trade-off between flexibility so that's taking as many parameters as necessary to have a good fit right and to have a low bias but we know and we've seen this in the beginning of the course that if we take too many parameters then there is this chance that we are going to well have a good fit but have an overfit right and if we take too many parameters well for this same amount of data we'll have lots of variance on the estimated parameters okay so we cannot take too many parameters in order to have a variance that is acceptable so we have here a trade-off between variance and bias the bias variance trade-off well when we talk about price of the model there are really two aspects well there is the aspect of identifying the model and then there is the aspect of once you have the model you are going to use it right so let us first talk about the first aspect well for instance the algorithm complexity will have an influence on the price you're paying while identifying the system right if you have an arx model then it's at least squares this is also the case for finite impulse response model it's a least squares problem so well from a computational point of view that's quite okay if you have other model structures this will lead to a non-linear least squares and this will increase the complexity it will also have a well influence on the criterion function in the sense that for instance with these other model structures you might end up in a local minimum so you'll have to do some tests there and start from different starting points and this is your theta zero from which you start the numerical procedure and see well if you can well find this theta zero that will lead you close to the global minimum there is also a price to pay when you're using your model if you have a high order model of course from an implementation point of view it's more difficult but also if you have a high order model your predictor will 
get information from the past so if you have uh, for instance if you compare a predictor that goes up to y t minus 2 and you have another predictor that takes information up to t minus 5 and then suddenly there is data lacking well in the first case after two samples your predictor is working again whereas in the second case it will be working only after five sample instance right so choosing a model that is as simple as possible is always a good idea well in order to select model structures there are three techniques well you can have information up front uh, for instance that you know that your system has a certain delay has a certain time constant that it is first order type or something like that you can also do preliminary data analysis and then finally you can test different model structures and compare a priori considerations have an influence on the type of model so as I said, you can use prior knowledge and you can obtain this, for instance, by discussing the process with control engineers that know the process very well. It's always a good idea, if possible, to physically parameterize the model. So this is really using equations from physics to obtain a model structure. Uh, this is called a white box model. If you can do this, do it, but of course this will lead to complex algorithms, okay? Because what you'll do is take your white box model, the parameters that you know very well, length, masses and things like that, you'll fix, but the other ones you'll have to uh, identify. So if you're using black box models, and this is what we're doing in this course, of course, try simple things first so you should not start with an rmax model try an arx structure first then test an rmax model and see if it's worthwhile using this rmax model structure because of course it's more complex and from an identification point of view it has disadvantages think of this well local minimum Sometimes it's worthwhile doing a nonlinear transformation to kind of linearize the data. And here you have an example, a log function, but it might be also a square root or things like that. Keep this in mind for the system identification uh, exercise or assignment. There might also be prior information about the model order. So by discussing this with the process engineer, you might end up with the knowledge that your system is of first order with a certain time constant. So what you could do is also obtain simple models. And I think that you should keep this in mind for your system identification assignment. So a first good candidate for simple models is the FIR model the finite impulse response model and you can use the command impulse est we've used this command in the beginning of the course when we applied it on the air dryer data so what you can do also is what is called spectral analysis and this is something that we have skipped because we have only a 15 hour course right and there is this command that will allow you to implement this in MATLAB. The idea is that, well, you kind of obtain the spectrum of the output, the spectrum of the input, and you divide both so that you have a direct identification of the frequency response of the system. And by looking at this frequency response, you might have an idea of a range of model orders. So this is something that you can explore further in your assignment. Well, preliminary data analysis or just simply data analysis can tell you a lot about model orders. So this non-parametric estimate, this is these 
what I meant by these spectral methods and using this command spa okay and obtaining really the estimation of the frequency response of the system we've talked about this matrix over here there was this other quantity f of n which was 1 over n a sum t is ranging from 1 to n of phi t phi remember is the regressor and then y of t and we had seen that in the case of an rmax model we had this least squares estimate and it was rn minus 1 fn right so rn is this matrix over here what what you can do is have a look at the rank of this matrix and this is something that you can build in your arx function and if this matrix becomes well almost singular or loses a rank well this is because you've well used too many parameters in your model structure so once you have identified the model you have the residuals and then you can ask the question would it be useful to add a new variable for instance this one here right in my model structure well then by correlating this variable with the residuals you can answer this question if the correlation is substantial it's probably a good idea to add this variable in the model structure if this correlation is very low this means well that in the residuals there is nothing that we correlates with this so it's no use adding this variable in the model structure well of course you can compare model structures and the way to do it is really to compare on fresh data sets so validation data sets remember we have talked about this in the beginning of the course you should split your identification data in two parts one that you have for identification obtaining the estimation right and then use the remaining part for validation so the criteria that you can use is a cost in prediction there you compare the measured output with the prediction usually the one step ahead prediction and this is really a prediction error costs but you can also compare the model in a simulation and then of course you only use the inputs and the input output transfer function and remember that you do this with n data points that come from your validation data set and what you can then do is well look at this in terms as the number of parameters right and since you're doing this on validation data what you will see is that the cost will go down at first and then at some stage it will start to go up again okay so this means that well you have to select the number of parameters that corresponds to this point over here because from here on you're starting to well, fit to the noise and if you try this model then on a new fresh data set well the results will not be very good well depending on your application you will either put the focus on prediction or the focus on simulation right in some cases well you want kind of a mix between prediction and simulation then you might use uh, cost in prediction but with a certain prediction horizon you know that if the prediction horizon goes from one and then you increase it well if this prediction in horizon continues to increase well you'll go to a simulation cost so by taking a prediction horizon that is maybe two three you're kind of in the middle between simulation right this is a prediction of a horizon of that is infinite and a prediction horizon of one in the system identification laboratory you'll probably be working on well rain 
river flow data for prediction of floods so you'll concentrate on this cost although i'll probably ask you to also kind of obtain a model that would be good in simulation in some rare cases there is no data that you can spare for cross validation so you have to do your validation using the identification data remember that if you're using the identification data and you increase the number of data points your costs will continue to decrease with the model complexity but what you will often see is something like this so this is the number of parameters so here you have your cost okay as a function of the number of parameters you will see something like this so a sharp drop at first and then from a certain point well the drop is slower okay so in the case where you cannot spare data for validation and you have to use your identification data to kind of detect the model order that you should use you should try to detect here this knee right and choose this number of parameters when you do not have data spared for cross validation on new data there are other ways also to see that you have uh, an overfit or that you have chosen the number of parameters too high and one sign is for instance near pole zero cancellations and we'll come back to that later but clearly the best situation is the one from the previous slide so that you divide your data set in two parts and that you keep this part this fresh data just to have a clear detection of the number of parameters that you should use we have often talked about this prediction error criterion right but the one that is used in the identification toolbox very often is the fpe or final prediction error criterion or icaicus final prediction error criterion and what it does is that it also adds a penalty for the model complexity so here is this final prediction error criterion it's the one that you know very well it's this one and you have this factor over here and you can see here that it's penalizing the model complexity so the dimension of theta model validation is a really important question and as an engineer when i'm producing something i should ask the question is it going to fit my purposes right so for model estimation you have to ask yourself the question is this a good model within my model structure did i choose my model structure well so there are different aspects of course and really model validation tends to kind of focus on this first question does my model fit the data but really the second question is often more important and this question is simply is my model model good enough for my purposes remember that you have simulation as a purpose you have prediction and you have for instance also control okay and this goes beyond the scope of this course but for instance if you want to obtain a model for control it does not necessarily have to be a complex model if this model that you're going to identify is good around the future bandwidth of the closed loop system this model is going to be probably a good vehicle to construct a controller when you are validating a model you should always keep in mind the objective of the model remember that it could be simulation prediction 
control. So for example, if you have identified a simple model, but that the controller that is designed based on this model gives a good result on the actual true system, you can consider this model to be validated. If you're identifying a physically parametrized model structure, uh, one that is obtained from the equations of physics, and you identify the underlying parameters, well, you should check if the underlying parameters corresponds with the physical reality. So you should check on their feasibility. The consistency of the model input-output behavior is a good way to identify a model. So assume that you have identified an ARX model, then you have, well, obtained an estimate of the input-output transfer function. It will be BN Q over a n q right so you can look for instance at the body diagram right so if you use the spectral analysis method this is a non-parametric method that will identify the frequency response directly well you can have a look at this frequency response and compare it with the frequency response that you have with the ARX model. If you have a good match, well, then you have consistency of the model input-output behavior and you can kind of validate this ARX model. If you can reduce the model without affecting the input-output properties much, and this can be done, for instance, if you have near pole zero cancellations, it means that the model was over parameterized, that you have used too many parameters in your model structure, and then you can redo the identification. Remember that this pole zero map can be obtained using the command, the MATLAB command, IO PZ plot, and we have used it in the introduction section of this course. You should always look at the parameter confidence intervals. If the confidence intervals are too large, well, this could mean that this parameter can be removed. In order to obtain this parameter confidence intervals, use the command present, and this is also a command that we have used in this air dryer example right so if you have a and so if this is really zero over here and you have here an interval a confidence interval that looks like this you can ask yourself the question and this is a given parameter if this parameter has to be in your model structure and if it cannot be removed well this is what we mean by this cartoon here that is associated to the web page of the course if for instance these are parameters identified for an arx model and that this is a one a two a three and then b1 b2 you can ask yourself the question since here the confidence interval is very large if you have to include this parameter a3 related to yt minus 3 in your model structure well if your goal is to have a very good model in simulation right then you first should use the right structure model structure and typically you use a model structure where g the input output transfer function and h the noise model will be independently parametrized so this means an output error model structure or a box jenkins model structure and very often you'll choose the simplest model structure so the output error model structure and of course then you have to compare your well actual data with your simulated data and well the simulated data is different than the predicted data so in terms of matlab commands you have to use the function compare 
Then you have you use your data. Obviously, you're going to use your validation data and then you use your model. OK, for instance, the output error model in this case. You don't put any arguments. So this means that you compare in simulation with a prediction horizon that is infinite. If you're interested in prediction, right, then you'll use obviously another model structure. You'll use, for instance, an ARX model structure, right? And then if you have identified your model, you're interested in comparing the predicted outputs to the measurements. So then you'll use a function compare, same function compare. You'll use it also on validation data. You'll use your model ARX, right? And you'll have to put here your prediction horizon, right? And very often you'll put simply one, okay? So beware when you use this compare function without argument, you're actually using an horizon that is infinite. So you're comparing your data, measured data, with your simulated data, right? So if you want to compare in prediction, you should put an argument here that is the prediction horizon. Well, when you're doing model validation, it's very important to look at the residuals or the prediction error. It's the difference between the actual data and the one step ahead prediction based on your model. And if you have a good model, this epsilon should really be a realization of a sequence of independent, identically distributed variables with a probability density function that is a Gaussian with zero mean and sigma square, right? And this can be tested using a so-called whiteness test, okay? And this will give rise to these correlograms that we've seen in the beginning of the course. We'll come back to that in the next section that is about really practical identification in MATLAB. But this is really very important. So don't forget in your assignment to look at these whiteness tests. We should also look at the residuals and correlate them with past inputs, right? Residuals, so epsilon t theta, it's the difference between well the actual measurements minus the one step ahead prediction. So what you should do is look at this correlation as a function of tau and this estimate based on n data right and again epsilon and u should be independent and there is an independence test and this well results in these correlograms that we've seen in the beginning of the course and we'll come back to that in the next section when we talk about practical identification so this independence is important if you see that there is correlation between the residuals and past inputs this means that well in epsilon there is information that can be explained by the input okay so this means that you should change your model structure in such a way that after re-identification really epsilon and u become independent well the whiteness of the residuals and the independence between the residuals and the past inputs can be tested using the command resid uh, from residuals and this is also something that we have tested at the beginning of the course on this hair dryer example really do not forget this correlograms in your system identification laboratory as we have seen in the example of the air dryer what is done is that the autocorrelation of the epsilons is plotted as a function of tau with a confidence interval and you do something similar 
for the cross correlation of the epsilon with the u's okay and when for instance for this one the auto correlation the values fall inside the interval you can assimilate them to zero in this autocorrelation you should have values close to zero everywhere except of course in tau is equal to zero because the residuals will correlate with themselves if you shift everything then there is no correlation anymore ideally and for this cross correlation of the residuals with the use well the value should be zero everywhere so that you have small values that fall inside the in confidence interval this autocorrelation function of the residuals is going to be used to validate the noise model and the cross correlation function is going to be used to validate the input output transfer function so an example of this or on how this can be used is for instance if you have used a delay of two in your model but the actual true delay is one then you will see in this cross correlation function that epsilon will correlate with u t minus one so at lag one you will see something that will fall outside the confidence interval and in this case it will be the sign that you have a wrong delay that has been assumed in your model